Great. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining um, Aurora Expedition's online information session on Patagonia. Uh, so um, just to let you know, my name is Victoria Primrose, and I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. Uh, and I'm Head of Marketing for Aurora Expeditions. But today's presentation really centres around our special guest and Patagonia expert, Lelia Cataldi, who I'll introduce properly shortly. So just to let you know, we're actually streaming from a couple of locations live uh, today. So I'm streaming from um, Sydney, Australia, where I'm based. And we have Lelia joining us from um, Buenos Aires in Argentina. So hopefully um, there won't be, but won't be any delays um, due to the kind of different time zones that we're operating in. Um, but if there are any small delays, just please um, bear with us. So I'll turn off my um, camera and then I'll just take you through an overview of the agenda that we're going to cover today. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit about Aurora Expeditions um, briefly before we go into um, focus on Patagonia. Then I'll introduce Lelia Cataldi, who's our Patagonia um, expert. She'll take you through a little bit about Patagonia, give you an overview um, of, the, of the, this great destination, um, talk about some of the key things to see, and then talk about um, travelling in Patagonia and how you see Patagonia by sea and also um, trekking options. I shall then pass back to me just to give you a bit of an overview of our ship um, as well. We'll talk about some of the activities that we offer um, and then we'll finish with a Q&A with Lelia as well as um, special offers available for those who attended today's session. Um, just to let you know, for the Q&A section, we will be answering questions that you submit live during the presentation. And you can see on the right hand side, um, just in your toolbar, there's a section called questions. So if you just type into the, um, the, the field any questions that you have for us, we'll be receiving these throughout the presentation um, and we'll be asking these to Lelia during the Q&A section. So now we'll um, begin and give you a bit of an overview of what um, Aurora Expeditions is about. So we have a very long history of over 27 years at expedition cruising, traveling to really wild and remote, natural, uh, beautiful places. So our uh, ethos is really around small groups, whether that be small groups of hikers. Um, we all only have a um, maximum number of 20 hikers on um, any, any trek or about small ships um, with an average 120 passengers, 126 passengers per voyage. So it's really about maximising the experience for our guests, getting them out and about and having, them, uh, having as much of an adventure as possible. We offer really immersive um, wildlife experiences where you get an opportunity to get as po close as possible in a safe way to really um, see and experience the wildlife. Um, as mentioned, we have over 27 years experience and this has been really uh, inspired um, by our founder, Greg Mortimer, who's a well-known mountaineer and adventurer who set up Aurora with this ethos of offering adventurous intrepid holidays. We offer truly authentic expeditions. No trip is the same and we really maximise the experience based on the weather on the day or to maximise wildlife viewing opportunities. And that's why we've won a couple of awards. Um, we have an expert expedition team, um, whether that's on board during your voyage or taking you on your trek, um, that are really experts in their fields and have um, some amazing backgrounds um, in, in the local area and in um, topics such as history and wildlife. Um, as mentioned, um, we are Australian owned and that really inspires, um, being Australian gives us this um, relaxed atmosphere on board and also inspires our kind of spirit of adventure. That's um, a little bit about us. Uh, now I wanted to introduce our guest speaker for today, um, which is Lelia Cataldi. So just to um, tell you a little bit about her, Lelia, I might ask you to turn on your webcam so yeah. you can say hi hello to everyone. Hola, Lelia. Hello, hola. <laughs> so um, Lelia is actually joining us now from her hometown, Buenos Aires, um, and she's been expedition leader for Aurora Expedition since 2013 and has led many treks in Patagonia uh, during her time with us. Um, prior to joining Aurora, she actually completed studies in both tourism and geography, and after graduating, she then became a guide at Los Glaciares National Park, located on the Argentinian side of Patagonia. Um, she's actually lived for 10 years in El Calafate, um, where she enjoyed breathtaking views of one of the best glaciers, um, Pareto Marino Glacier, um, which she enjoyed on a daily basis 
and she loves working outdoors and taking great delight in helping others enjoy and discover nature, especially if it's in South America. So welcome Lelia again and thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I will tell you a little bit about the options to visit Patagonia and what to expect when you are there. So I will go back to the presentation and then come back uh, to you if you have some question at the end. Sorry. So here we have a map of Patagonia to start. As you see, it is uh, the southern part of South America that covers both sides of the Andes. Chile on one side and Argentina on the other side. And the Andes are in the middle together with a big Patagonian ice field. So this is one of the main things we are going through and um, that makes Patagonia so special. It covers from the Pacific to the Atlantic as well. On the Pacific side, as you see in the map, in the Chilean side, we have a lot of fjords and of course the glaciers coming down to the ocean. And the Argentinian side of Patagonia, it is a bit more flat after the Andes and uh, it's, we can find their forests, but also the Patagonian desert that we call in Spanish Estepa. It's a very, special area of the world, as you know, has a very low population density and we can feel that and it's still very wild, which makes a really lovely place to visit. So I will sh show you some pictures uh, along this presentation, but first of all, if you think about when to visit Patagonia. Well, with Aurora we offer um, trips from October to May, which is actually the best time to be there if you're thinking on the landscape and discovering the place. At the beginning of the season from October to November is the late spring. And well, this is actually the best time, for example, for flowers. If you are walking through or visiting the forest, you will find a lot of flowers there, especially orchids, which are really lovely. It is also the start of the breeding time for the wildlife and really make a special nice encounter with the little ones. Then we have the summer, the center of the season. It's between December to February, which is actually the high season for Southern Patagonia. And the good things on that time of the year is that daylight is very long day. So we can start very early in the morning and have a long day to come back at the end and still light so it makes a great day for explorations and then at the end of the of the season between march and may it's already getting the autumn so that the most important part of this of the year there is that the forests start changing colors which is really lovely and it makes the landscape even more special so you will get all the colors the evergreen Trees will stay green, of course, and then we have red, yellow, orange. It's really beautiful. So I would say every time uh, we can find something special in Patagonia. Um, what is Patagonia famous for? Well, I will say first the Andes. You have heard about the Andes and it goes from, the, from north to south all the way, so that means we will always have the mountains in our background or we are just going there at the base of our of the mountains in this picture we have two of the most important peaks we can find uh, in southern patagonia one is the fitzroy and the other one is cerro torre which are very famous for climbers has been known as the impossible mountain but nowadays those places have great trekking trails. That means we as trekkers can reach the base camp of these mountains. And well, that's make Patagonia so special that you are very close to the mountains. In a day hike, you just get to the base camp. You don't need to walk for many days to get close to them. Every corner of Patagonia has a breathtaking scenery. It really does. So you, you have lakes or fjords, 
the forest, the high peaks, all the glaciers coming down from the mountains. So it's really um, a great place for scenery. In any corner you go, you will get yeah, views like this. So for the ones who like photography, it's lovely. It's really a special place. And then of course the fjords and the glaciers are one of the most famous um, things in Patagonia that we will find. And in this southern part of Patagonia, they are just all around. As you see here in the pictures, you have the high mountains in the background and the glaciers coming down from that ice field in the top of the mountain into the valley, closer to the forest, and also giving us the opportunity to get close to the glaciers, sometimes walking or sometimes um, on the, from the sea, on a zodiac or on a kayak, we can get close to them. Um, and then, of course, Patagonia has very vast open space, as we we saw on the map first. It's it's a huge area, and because there are not so many settlements around, you will find often views like the ones you have here in the picture: mountains in the background, and then along a big space open. That's also a great moment to find wildlife. In this picture, we have, for example, three condors flying, something that is very usual in Patagonia. The condors are always around us. And the other very famous things which makes Patagonia really very, very special is the Patagonian ice field. It's actually the third largest ice field in the world. So first we have Antarctica, Greenland, second, and then this is the third one. It's really a big ice field and well this is what we are going to visit from Chile or from Argentina we can get close to that big ice field and that's make Patagonia that's something unique you can find there some of these big glaciers are for example one of them is the Perito Moreno glacier in Los Glaciares National Park in Argentina and they are really very close to the land in this case so we can just be in front of of the glacier and spend long hours watching how they calve and how they move. The icebergs is, well, it's really, really very beautiful. This is one of the most famous glacier in the, in the area and it's one of the ones that we are going to visit in our itineraries. Or you can also get close to the glaciers as you see here in the picture with a zodiac, or if you choose the kayak activity, you can get always in a safe distance, of course, but you can get close to them. So this is something what you should expect if you decide to travel to Patagonia. And then of course we have a lot of wildlife. Here in the picture, you see the Wanaco. You may know the llama maybe more than the Wanaco. They are from the same family. There are four, um, it's there from the family of the camelids and there are four in South America, llama, alpaca, and then we have vicuña and guanaco. The guanaco is the only one that we can find in Patagonia, but they are uh, always wild. They cannot be farmed actually. So um, we will see them around all the time. It's a very healthy population of guanacos. And well, they're wild animals, but they're still around all the time. And there's something, a very typical thing that we will find in Patagonia. As well as other native animals, like here we can see the red fox. We have two native foxes in Patagonia. One is the red fox and the other uh, is the gray fox. Um, they're also very common to see if we are walking through the forest or even sometimes when we are moving from one place to the other or driving on the road, um, foxes are always around. They always, we always see some of them. Uh, Wemul, the Wemul is also a native. It's a, it's a native deer, which is actually a very endangered animal. And many years ago, it was very, very difficult to see them. But in the last years, in my experience, I always see one in, 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 on the trails. And they are recovering after some conservation programs, they're coming back and it's really a lovely news. So we should expect to see some Wemul in some of the trails, which is actually great and lovely, our native deer. And then for the ones who love birds, but actually for everyone, we have lovely birds 
in Patagonia, one is the flamingo that you can see here on the picture. They will spend the summer in Patagonia and then they will migrate to the north, but that means they are going to be there on the time we visit the area. So they are always in some small lakes close to us. It's very common to see them and they're really lovely, especially when they are flying open the wings, you can see all the colors. But we also have many other birds. Here you can see the Magellanic woodpecker on the right side, the biggest of them. They're also healthy in the forest and we always see them or hear and they're very um, close to the people. If you don't make much noise, we will see them. And then, of course, the condor, you can see here a picture in the middle on the top, some condors um, getting ready for breakfast. Um, condors are also a healthy population in southern Patagonia. That means we always see them, sometimes very close, sometimes flying high in, in the sky. And often we also see them on land. If, if they find some, some food or so, you will see a lot of them. But um, it's great to know that they are always there. And we also have some geese, like the upland geese in, in the picture, Lisa Rear, some the pygmy owl, but there are really a lot of birds for the ones who like photography or bird watching or just enjoy the wildlife. These are some of the encounters we have when we are walking through the forest or the steppe. And the forest in Patagonia is also special. It's, um, it's actually, together with Tasmania and New Zealand, it's the only place in the world in which you can find these family trees, the Notophagus. They're going to be different species, but it's a really lovely special forest. And those are the ones that we are going to see on both sides of the border in Southern Patagonia. So we are going to be, walking uh, or getting close to different types of forests. Sometimes they are high in the top of the mountain. Sometimes they are in protected valleys. So um, these are what we can encounter if we spend some time in Patagonia and get close. It's really lovely in the picture. We see how they are start changing colors, for example. So traveling to Patagonia now. Uh, in this map, we can see three itineraries that we do with Aurora. The yellow one that you see here in, 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 in the map is the Patagonia Discovery Trek, which covers um, Chile and Argentina. It's a 10-day itinerary. The blue one is the Torres del Paine Explorer Trek. It's also a 10-day trek. It's only on the Chilean side, but more deeper, getting now inside the National Park Torres del Paine. And then the red itinerary you can see on the map is the Patagonia and Chilean Fjord voyage that starts in Ushuaia and finishes in Puerto Montt that covers a, a longer distance. So these are the options that you can have, for example, to travel through Patagonia. So if you think about voyage or trekking in Patagonia, what should I do? Well, that's hard to say. I would say you should do both. <laughs> but I will say it's uh, a little bit depending on what you expect or what you want to see and experience. If you think about the map and you want to visit the fjords uh, in the south of Patagonia, you will see there is no road at all. There are so many fjords and islands and the glaciers. Remember, there is the ice field there in the mountains. So there are actually no roads on Chilean side. So that means you, if you want to visit that fjords and the glaciers coming down into the ocean, the forest, you need to travel uh, on ship, on a ship. So the voyage will be on the best option you have to get closer to these places. And if you want to experience more, getting closer to the mountain and deeper inside and, and be more in contact um, or longer time into the forest and the steppe, well, maybe trekking is um, what you should do. But remember that both trips uh, or both ways to travel, they offer you different views of Patagonia. So, um, I will start talking a little bit about Patagonia by sea. So, and which will be the benefits of 
doing that voyage with Aurora Expedition. It's an expedition voyage, remember. So even if you are on a ship, it's a very active trip and you can have a different uh, activities and different ways to explore Patagonia. First of all, you can cover longer distance. So you will be starting in an, an environment like the ones you will see in Ushuaia and the fjords, the channels down there, and then keep moving to the north. And the weather also changed a little bit, the forest will change and the landscape until you reach the north of our voyage in, in Chiloé and Puerto Montt. That, so it cover longer distance, will you give you more um, different view and diversity of the landscape. And then you can combine this with Zodiac cruise or kayaking and some short land excursions. So it's a very good mix of activities. And then the other good thing is that you're going to be on the ship. So you just pack and unpack one and you have your home there and you will be surrounded with a lot of experts that will give you lectures and explain and help you to learn about the places you are visit during all the voyage. So that's, um, that's really good benefit. And then of course you have uh, wildlife encounters. In this case will be with marine and also land wildlife because you are going to be on the both environment. So that will be the benefits of a voyage, if I could say. So that's one of the pictures you could expect, but the main thing is that you're going to be on the ship, but then always every day with activities on that you go down into the zodiac or kayaking to explore and to get close to the glaciers, mountains or, or to shore. So what uh, encounters you could expect? Well, for example, here we have pictures of the Magellanic penguins and sea lions. They're very common in Southern Patagonia. And this is what you should, what we expect to see, as well as a lot of marine uh, birds. And we also hope to have encounter with whales in this trip. So uh, we are on the right time of the year to see the humpbacks that they are moving from south to north. And if we are very, very lucky, we may see also some blue whales because they are around there. We just to be, to need to be lucky to see them on the right moment. So here is the map of the itinerary of the Patagonia and Chilean Fjord expedition. So as I told you before, it starts in Ushuaia. It's a city in Southern Argentina. But as soon as we start, we move to Chilean side and start sailing up to the north to visit the different fjords and glaciers coming down from the mountains. We also stop in National Park Torres del Paine, which is great, and we spend there one night on shore. So they give us two days of exploring the National Park, one of the most important in Southern Patagonia in Chile, and give us the opportunity to make some treks there and visit the, the beautiful Torres del Paine range. Then we keep moving north. We will be see some other very famous places like the Pio 11 glacier. And one, it's the biggest in the ice field. And then Puerto Eden, for example, but different places we are going to visit in the fjords, making activities during our way. Going up to the north in, into the Corcovado National Park, also a very famous place in Southern Chile. And after this, we will visit Castro in the Chiloe Island, which is also a very special uh, stop. So we will have a combination of nature, landscape, wildlife, but also local culture. Chiloe is a very famous island in Chile, and it is protected by the UNESCO, especially the architecture and the, the churches they are there. But it's also very famous for food, has a very special local and traditional food that we will be able to have um, to taste or to have encounter with locals in that place. And then it, the, the voyage ended in Puerto Montt, also Chile. It's a bigger city and from there it's a great place to keep uh, traveling if that's your plan. So it's you will be covering almost all the southern Chile and visit all different landscape and a lot of um, 
yeah, great views around the trip. So if you think about trekking in Patagonia, that's the other way to visit Patagonia, which will be the, the benefits of a land-based trek? Well, as I told you before, I think it's, uh, it's easier to get a deep exploration if you are on land all the time. So if you spend 10 days on land in Patagonia, moving from one national park to the others and making all the trails possible, you will get really a very uh, deep encounter with, with, the, with the place. We have always small groups, which is actually great for the exploration and the experience you will get with the, with the Patagonian expert and the lo and local guides that we will have. And of course, it's, it's an adventurous trip. We always have a plan of a walking, sometimes shorter, sometimes a bit longer, depending on the day, a good balance so you can rest someday and then make some other long hikes. So it's, they are very, very active. And then it also gives you more chances to get in contact with locals and the local cultures and taste local food. So this is what you should expect if you decide to travel on land through Patagonia. Um, well, there are some pictures just to give you an idea of the places we will reach. Um, the Bose itinerary that I am going to explain shortly uh, that Aurora offers and they're based on a 10 days uh, trek in which we have long days of hiking or less or shorter days of hiking. So we have a mix of everything. And we just got to places like this. For example, these pictures, we, we took it in a lookout that was take us just one hour to get there. So sometimes you just walk briefly and you get to amazing views. Patagonia has always a nice place to visit and then we also go to sorry i just wanted to show you we we move from one place to the other often especially inside national parks and so we always stay in local accommodations which are always yeah they're always good located that give us always good views and most of the time our hotels are just there where we start walking. So we start walking directly from the door of the hotel. So there are always great places to visit. There are local um, small hotels and that give you again the opportunity to taste local food, to get in contact with local people and just to feel you are immersed inside the national park and the landscape. So I will start just briefly talking about the Patagonia Discovery itinerary which the one you see here in the map, it's a 10 day trek, which visits both sides of the border. So you visit Argentina and Chile. And we visit two of the most important national parks there. In Argentina, it's Los Glaciares National Park, and in Chile, it's Torres del Paine National Park. So that gives us the opportunity to do the most important and most beautiful treks on both sides of, of, the can of both countries of the Andes. So in Argentina, the highlights will be the Perito Moreno Glacier in a, close to El Calafate, and then in El Chalten, where we spend there three nights. We um, are going to walk to the Fitzroy Base Camp and Cerro Torre Base Camp, so the mountains that are very, very famous there. And then we cross the borders to visit Puerto Natales, a little town there, and from there we go into the National Park Torres del Paine to spend there some days walking. Um, to see the Pine Range all around and discover beautiful landscape and wildlife that we will have there. So I, I put here some pictures. This is, for example, a picture of the Cerro Torre Base Camp. As you see on the left, that's one of the main lookouts. Uh, that, and on, on the other side, that's just to remember you that we are going to be walking through undulated terrain. So you don't need to be an expert, of course. We don't need to be climbers to walk through Patagonia. We just need to be fit enough to be to walk through the yeah, undulated terrain, sometimes going up, sometimes going down. There are some rocks or roots. So it's good to be prepared, but don't be afraid. You don't need to be very, very expert. Just get ready to walk. Uh, they're always in, in both itinerary, and this is great. We always have 
chances to split the group and to make shorter treks to get some some intermediate lookouts for the ones who don't want to walk too long and for the ones who want to walk longer we can always offer a longer trek like to get to to further away lookout so there are always good opportunities for everyone and great views of course for example this is the trek to the mount fitzroy to the fitzroy base camp and all the way to the base camp there are great views as you see the picture the three pictures are have been taken in different part of the trail and all the trail has great views so even if you decide to do the shorter way you will get great views and if you decide to go to the top you will just get closer to the mountain and for example see the glaciers coming down from that mountain so there are amazing views on these trails and the other itinerary that we have with Aurora is the Torres del Paine Explorer. It's also a 10 day trek, but in this case, we will just stay on the Chilean side and we will focus more in Torres del Paine National Park. That means we will spend longer time inside the national park, which give us the opportunity to do more trails inside the park. So these treks start in Punta Arenas in Chile and then we keep going north through Puerto Natales again, this little town I told you before, and from there inside the National Park Paine. Once we are there, you may have heard about the W Trail in Paine, a very famous trek um, in, in Paine. So what we do in this trek is to do two of the hikes of this W. One is, is the... Um, French Valley, and the other one, it's called the base of the towers. So, and we also, we do these trails that are actually very famous, but we also do some other trails that are, um, I would say secondary trails or less visit. So that this trek gives you the opportunity to also get the feeling of being alone inside the national park or get deeper um, encounter with, with, uh, the forest and the wildlife as soon as we move to places where less people are walking so we get more chance to have encounter with wildlife of course so i will show you again some pictures um, about this trek this is for example the base of the towers and um, again it's a long trek but we can also make some shorter ways to do it so there are opportunities for everyone but you get the feeling you are in the middle of the mountains and that you get really the experience of being there in Patagonia outside, getting ready for all the weather you can have uh, with beautiful um, views all the way in all the treks we do. This is another picture, for example. Again, that, that's a trek of 45 minutes only, but as soon as we go a little higher, we already get the great view of the Paine Massif, which is in the background of this picture. So this is Mirador Condor, one of the trails we can do in, in this uh, inside the National Park Paine. And as you see, the terrain sometimes is almost flat, sometimes going up a little bit, but it's never too difficult or too technical. It's just adventurous. <laughs> so as a resume of what we, are, we have been talking about, in the three itineraries we offer to visit Patagonia, you can um, choose on hiking, longer or shorter. And you can have kayaking, of course, on the voyage. Zodiac cruising, especially on the voyage, we, all, we also offer some Zodiac cruise uh, on the Patagonian trek one day and photography in every itinerary remember that on the voyage you will have uh, photographers on board that will help you and teach you how to go through or how to make your best pictures during the voyage so um there are three active three great adventures itinerary to discover patagonia i would say so i hope that helped you I will pass back to Victoria now, and then if you have some questions, we will come back to you. 
Great, thanks Lelia. Um, so just before we um, move to the Q&A section, I just wanted to give people a little bit of an overview of our new ship, um, which is the Greg Mortimer. So um, it's really a purpose-built expedition ship, which has been built for viewing amazing scenery and, and fabulous wildlife. So it has these fantastic hydraulic platforms that actually fold down from the side of the ship, um, which allows you to get closer to the action. Of course, we have some pretty amazing viewing and observation decks, which you can see it in the bottom left hand photo, um, which just give you an idea um, of how you can actually look out from, from the deck of the ship. And of course, we have these nice lounges um, inside the internal area with um, glass, which allows you to look out from the comfort of being inside the ship, um, probably with a cup of tea or a hot chocolate, as I often had in hand on my, on my trip. Um, and where we also host um, some of our lectures. So that's just a quick overview of the ship. Um, and we have a lot more information on our website um, for those of you who are interested in our voyages and the, and the Patagonia voyage in general. So now um, we're just going to move on to the Q&A section. We've had quite a few um, questions asked. So I'll just, Lelia, I'll turn on my camera and I'll just ask if you can turn yours on as well. Yes. Great. Thanks, Lilia. So we just had a few questions that have popped up throughout the presentation. And um, if anyone has any more, um, now's your chance. And, and if for any reason we don't get to your question, then we'll um, send a response to you following the, following the presentation today. Um, so Richard asks, um, what's a typical day like of trekking in terms of how many hours of walking um, you might do or kilometres covered? Okay, so a regular day, we normally start at eight walking around um the longest trail we do there are 20k so 10k going up and 10 day 10k coming back but we as i told you before we always have an option to make the same trail a bit shorter so what we do is if necessary we split the group in one of the main lookouts in the media lookouts and then we come back so that means for those who want to have a long day of walk they will have a 20K, that means sometimes we come back between five or even seven to the hotel. So it, it ended up a whole day of walking with our lunch box. Mm -hmm. We come back to the hotel for dinner. And for the ones who prefer maybe shorter, I would say um, they need to be able to walk at least four hours on the mountains. That could be three Ks, six Ks, it depends on, on the, on the trail, how difficult it is, but there are always a chance to do like a bit shorter and not so demanding. So there are options for everyone. But yeah, the day start normally around 10, uh, sorry, yeah. around 8 in the morning. Yeah, and sometimes are long. If you decide to do the whole trek <laughs> and back, you will be back for dinner. And Lilia, presumably that in, in, um, involves a few rest stops as well along the way. Oh, I yeah. Imagine. Yeah, okay. yeah, we Good. do it in, in. I'll ask that question on behalf of Richard in case he was wondering. No, no, no. We do, we always do in a good pace, a pace for yeah. everyone. Remember, the groups are not big, so we are able to manage that properly. No, no, we Perfect. do a lot of stops, not only for resting, but also for pictures and and having an explanation of who we are, what we are looking at. Great. And then another question from um, Sarah was, how fit do you need to be to um, participate in the trek? How fit? You, yeah, sorry. so you talked about being able to walk about four hours, but in terms of how much training you should do, would it just be to get to that level? Yes, well, I will suggest, yeah, to train. If, even if you are not a trekker, train before coming. And yes, you need to be able to walk at least three hours or four hours, but remember an undulated terrain. So Patagonia is never flat. So it's good to be able to, to go able to up and down, right? So it's good to be trained before coming. Great. Um, and then I just had a question. There's been a few questions about the um, weather. So Judith asks, well, there's a few people ask of what is the weather like in Patagonia? And then what happens when the weather is bad specifically from Judith during okay. a trek? So um, remember, we are going to be in the summertime or in the, in the best time of the weather, but Patagonia changed a lot the weather. So in all the places we are going to be in the same day, it can change a lot. So even if it starts raining, it may change 
in, in a few hours later into Sunday, a sunny day, or suddenly the, calm, the wind comes. So we really always, when we start our day, we always are prepared for all the weather. So we always have a jacket with us, uh, sunscreen, sunglasses, um, a lot of layers, which helps you if you are walking to take it out and then put it again when we stop. And if you are outside on the cruise or on the Zodiac or even on the ship, you get cover because of the wind and it may be wet and then you go out. So we normally never stop um, a trek if it's bad weather. The only thing uh, we need to be is to be safe, of course. So if extremely too bad the wind, we may change the trail. But um, the rest, we just get prepared for everything. So we are covered if it's rainy because it really happens that we start raining and then in three hours it's just changed. And the weather changed very fast in Patagonia. So be prepared for all the weather and don't um, get afraid if the days start very bad, it may change very fast. Okay, and just one question off the back of that. Do you ever get any snow in summer? <laughs> Yes, you get, you get okay. something. <laughs> everything. So that it happens. Yeah, we got, um, some one time we got a, a white Christmas in one of our tracks. Even wow, in some okay. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, we do have quite a few more questions, but we just have um, time for one more question um, today. But there's been a few other questions um, from Joanne and Drew and Duncan. I'll make sure that I um, will follow up with you with a specific email afterwards um, to answer your question. So the last one was, um, so uh, this was Louise was thinking about um, asking, um, looking at pairing a Patagonia Trek and an Antarctica cruise and just asked whether it would be better to do the Patagonia cruise first or um, after the, her Antarctica voyage. Oh yeah, well, that's a good question. All the Patagonian treks are, com are in combination with an Antarctic trip. So you always can do both. Sometimes uh, Patagonia first and then Antarctica or the opposite way. Um, I will say um, it's not a big difference. Both ways are very good. I think it will depend a little bit of um, everyone. So if you prefer to have the more active a part of the of the boy of the whole trip at the beginning like if you have been training a lot and get fit for the treks maybe you want to start with the trek and then get into the voyage the voyage is a bit less active but it's still very active so once you are on on antarctica you will have um everyday activities all the time and on the other way um, passengers who do first Antarctica and then the trekking, they, they also have very good comments and they also enjoy, they have already the voyage uh, done into Antarctica and then they come to keep learning about glaciers and discovering Patagonia. So I will just, uh, there are good options, both of them, just find the best way to you. Great. Okay, thanks Lilia. Um, and sorry, that's all the time um, we have for questions.